This is cocktail time, not Q&A time. We do it anyway. I don't care. Well, thank you for coming. I know it's Saturday, and I know that in a couple of hours, we all should be sufficiently polluted. <laughs> and that's always a very good thing. So before we get started, uh, I just want to, you know, take the time to say to everyone on this stage, thank you for the memories of, of some really classic movies, and probably some of the most vital movies that's come out over the last couple of decades, because who in the world hasn't looked at Doug Bradley and, and, and hear him I, I say... to do violent things to him. Yeah, and, and, and well, that's later. But, and heard him deliver lines like, we'll tear your soul apart, and didn't go, holy shit, that's fucking nuts, right? And, and who hasn't felt the terror of poor Ashley? Isn't, isn't it cool to see them smile at each other? Usually there's screaming and chains and crying. It's disturbing. You have a, you have a thing for each other in the movies. You haven't figured that out? Well, yeah, but, you know, we're leaving that to them. <laughs> Insider stuff. Insider stuff. So let's get started. Any, first of all, are there any questions right off the bat? Okay, then we're going to bullshit until you have some questions. So don't mind if we just turn our backs on you and stuff right now. We're going to break out the mics. <laughs> no questions. All right, so we're done, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Now, right, well, let, let's start from the... Well, first of all, it's interesting to see Doug here with... Barbie and Simon. So, for those of you who aren't positive, although I can't imagine you would be, of course we have Pinhead, we have the female Cenobite who is ever so hot in all that leather, and then we have the diet superstar here. He played Butterball, and you can see he's looking dramatically thinner. <laughs> and you know what? Oh, you look very similar to Butterball. I do, man. You see? That's why they had me doing this. I had to bring some familiarity to it, since you guys look all normal and stuff. <laughs> All right, so it, it's so many years later, and these films are just so beloved, and, and they, with good reason. And Doug threatens us into liking them too, because it's fucked up. But <laughs> from, for starting from the from Simon, what do you think it is about these movies that really have lasted and have such staying power, and has turned into really a modern classic franchise in terms of horror? Um, I suppose it's. Uh, a. Clive's uh, fantastic imagination, but also his, his amazing attention to detail on, on all of the films. Uh, one of the things I really remember is, is the jewellery. They had a jeweller on the, the Hellraiser films who made all the, um, the, the torture implements that we had hanging around our belts, but also did the jewellery that went through your, your cheeks. And you very rarely saw them in any detail in the films, but it, it was that attention to detail and the, uh, the handles of the, all the torture implements hanging on my belt had wonderful little inlaid oh, uh, uh, scenes of people being tortured, um, none of which was ever seen, and those implements have disappeared into the ether, so nobody ever saw them. Yeah, but also the intelligence. It was the first time that, that it was in an intelligent horror film in, in an age of, that was going very much towards uh, comedy. And, uh, and a genre that wasn't going to take itself very seriously. So this was something that was going to take itself very seriously and expect the audience to also go along on that journey too and maybe think a little bit about uh, all these issues. I, I agree, actually. I think there's a, um, a courage in them and I think that there's an intimacy and a, a kind of uh, raw truth. Looking, looking at it as an adult, I was like, oh, holy shit, because I didn't realized when I was a kid doing it that the content was what it was but I do I, I think I think it told the truth and I think it wasn't afraid to to stay in a very small confined story <laughs> there's also elements in the film too that were very sexual and horror films are by their nature there's a lot of sexual elements running through it, but they aren't very obvious. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> you know, I just, you know, and this is Julia walking through and having little sort of flashbacks to her sexual thing with Frank, and you could just feel her re-experiencing it in the first one. 
Um, and that was, um, again, a very explicit thing that you was not really seen in more of them before that, I thought. Um, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm only going to embroider on what's already been said. I think um, the universality of the themes that Clive was dealing with um, and that he didn't he didn't really put much in the story or the film that would date, um, apart from a degree of big hair and shoulder pads going on with with, uh, with Julia, I guess. There isn't much in the film that has dated, and the Cenobites in particular will never date. You will be able to go back to this film when we're long gone, and the Cenobites will not have dated, I don't think. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why it's clear to me, and it's surprising and absolutely gratifying that there's a new generation finding these movies all the time uh, and finding them as fresh as we all did when we first saw the film 20 years ago. First of all, we were lucky enough to do Hellraiser 3. And these people had already set the groundwork for Hellraiser movies. So people are ready for another Hellraiser. And if Hellraiser 3 was a hit, it's because these people set the groundwork for Hellraiser 3. Uh, we had a really good time making it. Doug was there. It's probably the first time we made, uh, they, well, it was the first time they made a Hellraiser in the United States. We made this down in uh, High Point, North Carolina, and the surrounding area. Uh, my wife and I were the location casting directors in addition to being in the movie. And uh, it's been a wonderful thing for me. It's been a good ride. I love being the priest in it. And uh, you can thank these people for, that, for the Hellraisers. They give the start and it's, it's just flowing from that. So anyhow, I agree with what Clayton had to say, and uh, my role in this movie was uh, the blonde nurse who I delic delicately stroked the instruments that were being laid out on the table. See, it's that whole sexual thing again. Yeah, yeah, in the beginning of the movie. Right, 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 right. And uh, when the boy was on the uh, gurney in the emergency room, he was all chained and everything, and he got blown up and the chains got flying all over the place. I was the nurse and there got thrown against the wall, crying. So that was my big deal, other than doing the casting. But yeah, we're glad to be a part of the Hellraiser. So now, Clive Barker is really young and, he, and he's created probably a movie like we haven't seen before. I mean, there was so many striking visuals. And, and, and back then when Hellraiser first was released, it, it came out amidst the sea of slasher movies, a sea of this, just whatever was trendy. And then here comes a movie that literally broke every fad. I mean, just went against the grain completely what we're used to seeing in the movies. Now, when you got the script and, and, and you took a look at it, had a chance to read through it, I mean, what was some of the stuff that went through your mind? Like, wow, this is good. I mean, did you know it was going to be or turn out to be as special as it was? 